want to welcome everyone to our first soapbox in our new home. Our first guest in our first soapbox in our new home, I should say. Our guest has bet on rent.com, golfnow.com, and TweetDeck. Hard to believe he once passed on investing in Twitter in the early days. He's also responsible for coming up with the cash tag that differentiates Microsoft stocks from tweets from tweets just complaining about Windows. <laughs> now Twitter is using the cash tag. I want to get into all of that, but please welcome from warm, sunny San Diego, my hometown, Howard Lindzen. Of, of course, you're originally from Toronto, I believe, yeah, right? Yeah, born and raised in Toronto. Does my mic, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, can we? Can everybody hear me? All right. All right. But, um, you know, and how, how is San Diego? I haven't been back in six San, months. San Diego sold out. <laughs> so, there's a Seinfeld episode where he's like, oh, I want to come to uh, in Italy, that place. He goes, no, we're sold out. <laughs> so, yeah, San Diego's booming. There's no room. <laughs> and uh, you guys should be happy up here. <laughs> in your flat, barren, white wasteland. Right, right. We're, we're, it's always 78 degrees in San Diego, by the way. Yes. Um, well, I want to kind of get started and kind of go back a little bit in time before you were uh, with StockTwits and, uh, or before you founded StockTwits and you were a hedge fund manager. You created a daily business satire podcast and uh, you made investments in several companies, but you passed on Twitter, Zynga, and you failed to check in at Foursquare yeah. in the early days. Yeah, all three back to back to back. Right. Why, <laughs> why, why pass on those companies and... I got to go. I got to go. <laughs> 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 Why? Forget how dumb I am. You are idiots to be here listening to me. What, uh, I, I never fail. That's what people want to talk about. Well, what can I teach you about that? So I think the honest thing to teach, and this is, is, and I talk to my kids about this too, because I'm we're all flawed, but and truly, and in the market, we're the most flawed because we're wrong. Even good people are wrong 50% of the time. So not as bad as baseball, but we're, but we're wrong. And <laughs> I think I was inspired just because, you know, I did stand-up comedy as a kid, and that's the worst. So anything after stand-up comedy is easier than stand-up comedy, so stocks is like a step up. Because uh, I have a Jew and I can't play baseball. So you go, so you go into stocks. And, and so I think what makes us different, or what's my philosophy around investing and traveling and being a parent and, and husband is that you gotta have a sense of humor about it. And you gotta just talk about your stuff that you're wrong about more than the stuff that you're right about. And I think, I think if you can do that in a way, that's, that's my vision around finance. Uh, it's, it's a very niche thing, um, but it's working. And I think, it's, you know, you don't have to be completely honest and social webs helped us be more honest, and uh, I can give you my philosophies around all those products. But uh, you know, that's that's the way I look at the way I look through life. Is you know, I watch Seinfeld. And I go, oh, who doesn't <laughs> think like that? That's how I would. That's what happens to all of us. So they were. That's why they are the Tiger Woods of, were, of television shows. Is because they just did. They talked about stuff that was happening to us. And, and, uh, I didn't answer your question. So, I probably won't. <laughs> so why did you pass oh. it? <laughs> so there's no good reason. Okay, so I have a full, uh, so I have rules. So if you invest like I do in the market, you're going to be wrong all the time. The idea, and so again, I forgot to answer the question. You want to be in the batter's box, like what? The, you know, we're all going to swing and miss, but it is good to swing and miss. Uh, and so I mean, as long as I'm being talked about and being. The, the risk is not being asked. You say no long enough to good deals, people go, he's an idiot. But, so you have to, you know, you're gonna swing and miss. So uh, I'm proud that I was there. And the reason I was there to get the investment, and it was a gift basically, was, um, and there's a funny story beyond that, is that Fred Wilson, you know, I had basically cold called to invest in my startup idea called Wall Strip, was one of many startup ideas, but the one that CBS bought in 2007, which was a daily, uh, financial uh, kind of satire show, podcast, or a web, a web video show back when YouTube was starting. And <clears throat> we all made money, and Fred uh, thought I was smart, and Fred's a pretty damn good investor. 
show this is a flaw on his end. And uh, <laughs> everybody's not perfect. And uh, he offered me to invest 25 grand. But the valuation was 17 million. This was during the nasty market. And I was like, you are fucking insane. <laughs> if Twitter, you know, I, I was tweeting at the time, like, I went to the bathroom. I was kind of doing Foursquare of bathrooms. <laughs> Foursquare didn't exist, and I was using my BlackBerry, which I thought would never, but in 2007, I was like, you'll pry a BlackBerry out of my cold, dead hands. Those were like half my tweets. And uh, like, uh, Apple phone, retarded. And uh, so I would like, I'm peeing here. Well, I'm so dumb that I actually used to be peeing while I was tweeting. <laughs> And once you drop your first phone in the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that can be nasty business. Yeah, but so he offered me to invest. And I go, this, this, you know what would be interesting, Fred? Twitter for stocks. And uh, so I said, this is, you know, I don't know how they're going to monetize, blah, blah, blah. All the stupid questions that you ask. Um, the real reason I pass those is 17 million. I'm an angel investor and I'm a, uh, I have a philosophy around uh, price and, and what I'm willing to do. It was just way out of my wheelhouse. I was just investing in companies at two, three million valuation. So it was like one of those too rich for my blood. And the funny story is, you know, he hung up. He was like, all right, no, no harm, no foul. And he called uh, Jeff Pulver. So whenever Jeff sees me, he hugs me. Because Jeff said yes. <laughs> so Jeff made like four million off that phone call. So I think 25 grand would be worth four million. And, but you wouldn't see me here because I'd be on a yacht. <laughs> so you win. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. But but you later invested in, in TweetDeck, so yes. there must have been still something appealing. Well, about I was that using TweetDeck at the time, and I cold called Ian, who I truly in London, I was like, Ian, this is better than Twitter. Let me invest. And Ian didn't want money. And at the, you know, we invested uh, a group of us, BetaWorks and myself. I got a whole bunch of us involved. Um, we were really, he really didn't want to make. He's a real product guy, Ian, and I still haven't met him. And uh, and we raised a few hundred grand on a seven. So this is so this is between Twitter and TweetTech. That was a seven hundred grand valuation. So that like just I'll invest as much as I can in something like that. So it was just like from my years of investing, it just some of the stuff that comes in front of you and you kind of sift as fast as you can. You don't have a lot of time, and they don't really need me. Um, but that just made sense, and it was like whatever I can get. And I couldn't get a lot of it, but like he didn't raise a lot of money. I mean, Ian only raised a little bit of money. And uh, that was how I ended up with Twitter shares. Oh. And then I also invested in Betaworks, which ended up uh, starting Semise. Uh, that was a large investment of mine, because I loved the Betaworks studio model in 2007 when I saw them. And we, they invested in stock twits, John Borthwick and Andy Weissman, and I invested in Betaworks, kind of swapped. And then Semise happened. So I ended up with a lot of Twitter shares, <laughs> but not because I'm smart. <laughs> just by just by investing in other companies, it's, it came full circle. It came full circle, and I think it, the, the lesson is, and this is why I invest, is again back to the philosophers. It's just we're little people. We have no institutions. I don't have a Bloomberg. Uh, I'm face to face, I read all day. I, you know, the social networks have totally, obviously, amped up our smartness and our ability to suck in knowledge <coughs> from the right people. So I'm very bullish on that whole idea, um, but. The, 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 it's a trend. Like if you catch the trends right, you're not going to catch every pitch, but you're going to catch the fat part of a trend, mm -hmm. and we're still riding it. And for all the Twitters that I've passed on, I have some other huge ones that just made sense to me at the time. Right. And price was one of those things. I, is there a, a level of gut instinct going on when you, when you yeah. invest as well? Yeah, so you set these parameters. So for me, it's like, if it's above five million, why are you calling me? You know, now the stuff is like Y Combinator, 10 million. It's like, don't, don't, I can't. So you immediately have to just say no. I mean, like any good investor is like, these are my rules. Why are you calling me? Like, do, if you've done any work on me or read my blog, it's like, I don't know what I'm doing. At 10 million, I, I have to start thinking, how does this exit for 100 million? I'm not a venture capitalist. And none of these things should be spreadsheetable anyways at this early stage because we're all iterating, including StockTwits four years in. So how do you build spreadsheets uh, so a ten million dollar idea to me is like, oh my god, like this must already be a business. So you know, I'm like at that comfortable at that two to three million, good team. I love uh, people with domain experience. I think that matters more than anything right now. Everybody's starting companies, but nobody has domain experience. And and so I'm 48. I got I got domain experience on my ass. 
<laughs> I got, I'll lend domain well, experience. I can barter some domain experience. <laughs> so uh, I think a lot of these kids that are starting, and, and they call it a Series A crunch, it's really a crunch around knowledge, right. crunch around experience. It's just everybody getting nervous mm -hmm. that it'll pass because everybody's learning at least right now. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have everybody learning and failing than going to school for four years at some level. I'm not with Peter Thiel. <laughs> I think he's lunatic, but like, because uh, school's great, but I'm just saying, there is a tr there's a, there's a trade-off that's good. Right, right. It's it's, it's almost what was the question? It was passing on Twitter, but I think we we surpassed that question. Is everybody <laughs> satisfied that I'm an idiot? <laughs> <laughs> I think we could all just nod our heads. <laughs> but it, but it, but it goes back to almost what you're saying about having domain experience. If you don't, you you just kind of fail and fail again and, and, and you learn wander along the way. and you wander, right? Like I'm I'm from I'm Canadian, so maybe I'm a little more conservative. But um, and I failed through my 30s. I had tremendous success in my 20s, not because I'm smart, just I hit a good deal, or I hit a, I hit a fat pitch. And then in the 30s I struggle, and in my 40s I'm like, what am I good at? Like the 40s are the pressure years. You're screwing up in your 20s and oh, no, 30s. Like three it's more like, years. <laughs> yeah. Nothing even happens until you're 40. Because uh, you know, I was on my fourth wife by then, and I had a lot of experience. <laughs> Fifth, fourth, one of them. <laughs> Uh, no, my first, 18 years. So, um, so I think the 40s is all about domain experience, and I think that's getting under that's undervalued right now in Silicon Valley, and it's undervalued on Wall Street. Uh, MBA is still completely overvalued, um, but domain experience is my no domain experience and price. Now, if I'm investing in the stock market, it's the complete opposite. It's just about can I get out? It's about liquidity. Because in the early stage, I can't get out. So it prices everything. I don't care what Amazon, how the PE of Amazon, there's nonsense on TV. It's all mood and price and can I get out? Because we're all small investors. But at the early stage, it's very important to me because I can't get out, what am I paying? So I don't feel like an idiot when I can't get out. Gotcha, gotcha. And, and that love of stocks you even carried a little bit further when you did get stock in Twitter and then you went in on to create the Cash tag. Yeah. And was that kind of almost the, the birth of stock twits? Or tell yeah. us about that aha moment where you said, ah, I need to. I'm waiting for the aha moment, but uh, <laughs> the expensive moment was, and I'm still paying for, was when I was with Fred and I was like, this has got to be. Like, people will talk about, like, you know, with Blackberry and the PIN, all the brokers were using private network, you know, and then Blackberry, you know, everybody had a PIN number and everybody was trading inside information. So brokers obviously adapted. Uh, the pit. And I was like, I'm not a broker. And none of these guys are right anyway. So people will just text ideas and share them. And, you know, the haters or the non believers say, well, why would anybody good share a good idea? And I, I can't argue that point. I don't know. But I do know from YouTube and from Twitter that people share a lot of stuff. <laughs> and uh, so that was my bet, right? It was an open pin. And when I saw Twitter, I didn't get it per se, but I got the idea that people would do stocks. So the cash tag came from me using Twitter a lot and talking about trying to figure out who was talking about Apple and trying to separate who I went to the market to buy a green apple from I love apples or do I, I think I was just at the Apple store, it's crowded and I'm long Apple. So, so the whole idea of the dollar sign was like we already speak a language and that's the domain experience. Like the Rick code and the stuff that uh, Bloomberg and Reuters has is such a crime the way they categorize stuff, but good, good crime for them. And I was just trying to figure out a way to organize the discussion on Twitter. Um, and hashtag was just so much spam. You know, people were doing hashtag Goog or G-O-O-G, but how do you really pull that in? And so that's where we came up with the dollar sign. And luckily, you know, it just I kind of right. had to start talking that way, and I sent it to Fred Wilson. He goes, this is genius. And he goes, you should start a company. And I said, well, fuck you. <laughs> I still was working at CBS because uh, CBS had bought my last company and I bought myself out of the contract because CBS didn't really want to do anything in finance uh, except pay me. And uh, so we started Sockwitz in the, in the fall of 08 during the crash. And I've proceeded to raise 8.6 million and now we have uh, 14 people who despise me. So they're happy I'm here. <laughs> and uh, and now we've we've gone on to build our own separate platform. We're, you know we're we're battling, you know we're we're battling trying to create a product and a user experience that people who love stocks and love talking about them all day long 
come to StockTwits and share information, and they can send it to Twitter. So we, I really kind of learned how to plumb, and you know, my experience with, with, with Twitter in real time, super bullish on real time. And so I'm, I'm, I get to do both. I've been running a business, or learning how to run a business, and we've been at it four years, and then I also invest. So I'm on both sides of the, truly on both sides mm -hmm. of the table. Right, right. And, and with, with Sockwitz, though, you guys are like at about what, more than 200,000 investors over an audience, uh, an audience yeah, of over 40 million. Yeah. Like, what makes, uh, you know, Stock Twits unique as that social platform for investors and kind of how is it revolutionizing the way we think about investing in banking in general? Yeah, whew. I mean, revolution, I don't know. I mean, I, there's revolutions in my head and there's revolutions <laughs> that are in reality. Um, I think we're just clever and unique and hustling and really love stocks. Like, I mean, you know, if you love something, you, I mean, I, stock to it doesn't work for me, right? You know, I, I'm connected all the time. I love the idea of being connected to smart people. And I just wanted to filter the conversation, meaning, I talk about everything on my Twitter stream, or you know, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. You know, sometimes it's jokes, sometimes it's TV, sometimes it's stocks, and so I needed to compartmentalize that because some people don't want all that, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to change. I'm going to do what I do, but some people want to be able to filter and curate, and just mm -hmm. they don't want to care about Twitter. They care about stocks. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's what we've been, you know, that's what we've right. been doing. And, and I think our domain experience helped and we we're solving our, I was scratching my own itch. It was like, I know there's smart people out there uh, who, who are both talking about stocks and also a lot of smart people on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, who know so much about stocks but could care less about talking about them. And that's like TechCrunch and TechMeme and why, uh, all the products that we use. There's a lot of smart people talking about these companies with no, no care in the world about whether they're passing financial information or trading information. So how do you glean all this? And how does it make you a smarter person? And um, you can, you can get, let it get very complicated. I like to keep it very simple. It's like, you know, you find smart people and you kind of pick up on, you know, you only can manage so many ideas at once and you kind of really stay focused. But you have all this other stuff going on and it's really fun right now. I mean, we have close to 300,000, you know, registered users and it's a, it's a very narrow, audience of people who love stocks. So, you know, it's probably about a, a million uniques a month mm. in, on the website. And the mobile's growing really fast and nobody knows how to measure that stuff. Uh, so I won't lie to you there. But yeah, we're growing, we're growing really fast and we're trying, to, we're trying to figure out, you know, just like everybody else, how to make money off this right. stuff. And, and, and how is StockTwits now evolving from that kind of like 140 characters yeah. talking about stocks and a hashtag? And how are you progressing there? Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, the, the, that's where, you know, product and, and marketing and this is all the stuff that these kids starting out don't have experience at, including myself, is like, okay, so we got minimum viable product and we've got somewhat of product market fit. We probably had product market fit the first day. It's just a small market in a mm -hmm. really tight fit. Um, but, you know, I tricked my VCs into giving me money. So, um, so now you got to do something. The uh, how do you trick them? <laughs> oh, you lie, like everybody. Oh, okay, knows. gotcha. Well, I just want to make sure, you know. Yeah. There's no trick. You just look them in the eye and just tell them something else. Uh, I do that every day. That's, you know? that's what I learned on Wall Street. The uh, show, um, I forget. Uh, so we were talking about how the product evolved. So, so, so we're a real-time engine. We can try and do everything else we can, but really we're about what's happening now, curated down to stocks. So what we've done differently is like Twitter, we have this, this vision around curation and like behavior and like the message boards didn't work because as soon as you l leave people alone to themselves, like Jurassic Park, you know, they're gonna come at the fence, they're gonna keep coming at the fence, and then eventually they're gonna have sex together and two guys are gonna have a baby. <laughs> so that's like the long run, but short term, they don't know all this, so they're just misbehaving. And so we have house rules. So the, so the one thing that we wanna do on Stockdust is like, hey, it's for us, even though we're VC backed, this is like, you gotta behave. Meaning it's free, but if, you know, and you can talk about being negative, and you, but as soon as you start talking Obama and all the other nonsense and stuff that's just not on topic, you can go on Twitter. So immediately when we built our own platform, we were like, send the lunatics to Twitter and let them figure that problem out over on Twitter. But StockTwits is at least gonna have some common sense about it. Mm -hmm. So we sacrificed volume for utility. 
very tough decision, and we battle it every day. And the second thing is, we, we, uh, that, I, I have to lie. Yeah. It's terrible. No, so, <laughs> so the second thing we did was, um, which is important, is penny stocks. I'm really not a believer in, in any utility and companies on the bulletin board or pink sheets. I just don't think people should be, gam it's, it's all a gamble in a way, many ways, but you can manage risk on larger companies. So we eliminated the penny stocks, mm -hmm. which means you give up 80% of potential traffic, but you get rid of 90% of the spam. This like that. Because once you take away their will to like talk about nonsense, then, so you put up walls. And it sucks, and it's not viral, and it's not uh, something that VCs love, but it's very interesting. Mm. So, I, so, but, and so the, that's the basic philosophy of what, how we're evolving. And then what do you do with this data? And then the question is, is this data valuable and who will pay for it? And we're solving all those problems. We're doing, you know, we've been revenue focused from day one, which may have hurt us, may not, but you know, we, we're focused on revenue always. Right, you mentioned something about roadblocks and setting those up and, and all of that. I'm kind of curious, how do you also keep investors honest on your platform? There is no honesty. Everybody's a liar. I, I think you have to start with that assumption, because uh, then it's easier to like. Well, I'm, I, this is no joke. I mean, well, if you believe everybody's right. telling the truth, you're going to be sorely disappointed in life. And so, again, this is why everybody should learn the stock market and in, in investing, whether it's ten bucks or a thousand dollars, because then you'll realize that everybody's out to get you. And it's easier to start with that philosophy and go backwards than to start. At, oh, I'm going to make money. Because you're not going to make money. And you're going to bat 50-50 at best. So it's about managing your losses. And then the other thing is everybody's out to get you. So, but what's great about Twitter or short messages is you can't hide your true self. Facebook, you can be, I could be like a 700-pound Filipino person on Facebook. Truly, I'd still be Howard Lindzen because <laughs> I can say what, I, I can frame my discussion over there. Twitter, within two days, you are who you are, right? Mm -hmm. You're either interesting or you're not. And so, so... So I don't care what you look like on stock tweets. I just care what your ideas are matched up against a timeline. Because that's the true, mm -hmm. the true differentiator. It's not what you look like or smell like or how much you weigh or the color of your skin on stock tweets. It's truly, it's like, what did you say last week when the market was crashing? Uh, I can just quick back, I can look. And so you can't fake that. So, so the investors, so people that tell me, oh, baloney, I said, listen, just invest some time. Nothing's free. Like, even though StockTwits is free, you have to put in some time and go check out our suggested list and do your own homework. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think it's easier than ever to do that. Mm -hmm. And whether the guy calls himself Slingshot64 or Asset45 uh, <laughs> isn't where you should judge a guy on their ideas, because it's about the idea flow and uh, are they consistently good and, and will they talk to you? And so it's, about, it's behavioral. And we've learned this with Tumblr and Facebook and Twitter. People are, it's not about the avatar. I mean, it's, I like being myself. Keeps me honest. I just don't want to be six people. <laughs> um, but the web is, allows you to have many different identities. The creative identity, the true identity, the picture identity. And so I think we all have to like just figure that out. I can't teach right. people that stuff. Right. And, and for yourself, saying true to yourself, that's also evident in your blog, mm -hmm. and I kind of wanted to ask you about something you'd written on your blog, especially after you'd sold your Twitter stock and then Twitter mm -hmm. starts using the cash tag. And mm -hmm. I just want to quote this. Um, you can hijack a plane, but it does not mean you know how to fly it. What did you mean about that God, in that situation? That should be a book. The, uh, <laughs> it's poetic. I, I don't know what I meant. I was really angry. I knew they were going to do something. I mean, they should have done it four years ago. They did it to the hashtag. Again, like, what does it mean? It's just a dollar sign. We didn't own it. We could have we could have tried to patent that four years ago, and I don't know. And then someone would have sued us for trying to patent it. So I think it's execution, and nobody can read your playbook going forward. We're not talking about investing thirty million dollars in fabs and patents, and you know, we didn't have that type of investment. Mm -hmm. So we got to get a hold of ourselves. I was like, I was being sarcastic. It's like, okay, like, if I go search dollar sign W A G on Twitter, it's ethnic people talking about swag. WAG is Walgreens, so if you come to StockTwits, we're talking about Walgreens. So again, like, they have their thing, which is machines, and they're getting judged on volume of tweets per second. It's a great business if you raise a billion dollars. Uh, for the rest of us, 
and God bless them. Somebody needed to do it. Is that efficient? No. They didn't need a billion. Uh, they don't need 1,600 employees. And their sales are good because they have 500 salespeople. Their sales should be good. They have 500 salespeople. Um, so it is what it is, you know? And, and so they've taken it. There was no doubt they were going to take it. And that's why, we be, that's why I raised money to build a separate platform. For this day would come. And that was our bet. And now we've got to go execute on our own. You know, and LinkedIn turned off Twitter, stock's up 60%, <laughs> right? Like, so, you know, uh, there is no, I, uh, you know, do I, I, would it have made sense for them to buy us and use our knowledge? I am shocked that they didn't three years ago, mm -hmm. but nothing shocks me anymore, you know. So you got to go roll with the punches and execute on, on your game plan. Right, right. And does that and help? No, that does help. And it, interestingly enough, you, it kind of goes back to what you talk about also the domainic expertise and then breaking off and creating stock twits. You firmly believe in building communities of experts and that you would said in an interview that you had hoped that stock twits would inspire other experts in yes. their fields to go build these communities. Do you see that as the future of mm. social networking? Is it going to be these best of breed experts forming their own little ecosystems? Yeah, I mean, there is the best news surgeon in the world could use all these products to go siphon off and start a newsletter. And maybe that's what that person wants to do that's the best news surgeon. And you know, that's the person traveling to all these shows in Switzerland and learning about all the orthopedics. And well, it's just one idea. But I mean, every expert deserves, that's why we all use social media, is to just become. Uh, what do we, the, our special purpose, as, as Steve Martin would say. Um, and so we all now have the tools uh, to become experts. A lot faster than we did 30 years ago, when it was just a phone and a secretary. Now you, you are, I don't have an assistant, like it's all me. So um, the, you know, so I'm very bullish on verticals. You just have to, and as an angel investor, it's a little easier to invest in verticals than a VC. Okay, so you know, it's very tough in this day and age to be a VC in software because, you know, like Howes, you know, raised a ton of money, which is a really cool website my wife likes, and like Pinterest for housing. And then Zillow invests and starts their own, just one little vertical. So, so verticals are hard, but again, domain expertise matters and focus matters. I just don't think those businesses are going to be that big. But I, I, I'm, I, I practice what I preach. I invest in a company called Witstream, which is, you know, someone just like me, Lisa Cohen, who is a great app. She just curates comedians on from Twitter, and she's created this hysterical. So there's, you know, I don't want to hear Dick Costello talk about the Grammys. I want to hear comedians talk about the Grammys because they look at their TV all day making up stuff. That's who's funny. So, so Twitter is very hard to curate for more than what you really love mm -hmm. as one subject. So I really believe there'll be siloed experts in communities where I want to laugh. I open up Witstream because I know there's six topics that are funny in the world and they're just no holds barred on those six <laughs> topics. And is that a business? I don't know, but it's damn good product. And so you invest a little less money and you lower the market expectations and you, you swing for $10 million exits or $5 million exits. Um, but, you know, the, the, the companies that are leading right now, Google, Apple, LinkedIn, Facebook, they have so much cash. I mean, we're talking like people who are bearish right now are crazy because there's just so much cash in these big companies and they're going to have to spend the money on people. Mm -hmm. And people, and we're all training ourselves right now, so I'm super bullish. And that doesn't mean the market will, don't go buy stocks based on that, but you know, I'm super bullish. So I, I look at the world as glass is half full and I would tell people not to chase. Uh, let stuff come to you because there's so many ways to let information come to you. Set up filters and curations around topics and be patient. And, but there's just, we're in a major trend. Right. If a guy like me can pass on these things or at least be in the game and still actually have some home runs, I think there's, there's no excuse for everybody out there not to be able to do what I'm doing. That's kind of the way I write my blog and I was like, I can't believe this shit's happening to me. It's more like what a bunch of idiots these people are. Like if I'm doing this, so I think that's what part of the charm is. Like I can't believe I'm living in San Diego. Uh, with, yeah, I just can't believe I'm living in San Diego doing this stuff. It's great. Awesome. Where the best California burritos exist. Yeah.
Uh, that's, that's all the questions I have, Howard. I want to uh, throw it out to the audience and see if uh, they have any questions and all that good stuff. So who's, who's, who's first? Anyone? Okay. Brian. Uh, Andy Swan is a good friend of mine. He's like seven feet tall, uh, Kentucky boy. Uh, I saw, he, he's this very cynical guy, he's a stock guy, a friend of mine, and we invest together, and he would just put the widget on his site, and I go, if he uses it, I'll give it like the ninth chance that I gave it. And I really just started saying nonsensical things. So I, I look at Twitter, and I did stand up as a young man, uh, or boy, or idiot, and I failed so bad. It was such a stupid thing to do, but in Toronto, if you're Jewish, you do stand up. And uh, you make fun of your mom. <laughs> and on Skype. Now we do it on Skype. But uh, so what got me interested is like, oh, this is a great thing. Nobody's listening to me, and I can just say whatever's on my mind, and then maybe you know get a laugh and LOL out of people. So people like for, like I forgot that people smart followed me, and they really did think I was funny. So they were, everybody was encouraging me to just say nonsensical things. <laughs> and I look at Twitter, and I still think it's just more of a canvas than it is. It's a very lightweight canvas. And I said, well, imagine walking into, <coughs> you got a movie theater, and, and everybody's quiet just before the movie's going on. This, and the lights are out, and you get to, you barge in through the back door and scream an obscenity, and then you walk out, and you look back in, and you see what the reaction is. And you, have, everybody has a focus group, right? And it costs zero. So that's how, that's why Twitter's successful. You know, is that worth anything? No. <laughs> so that's their problem. Though. They've taken that problem on themselves. Uh, and that's going to be their cross to bear. It's very hard at scale, I predict. Um, but I was wrong at 20 million. I mean, so 10 billion, I'm probably wrong again. <laughs> but they don't make soap, so how could they really be worth something? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so from day one, we've, we've, we've we created a blog network and let people, you know, so we've made some mistakes along the way around revenue because we were revenue focused because I'm an old man uh, from day one. And we were like, what? we're not giving this shit away for free. So uh, we, we feel like we're, uh, uh, we're the lightest way for a financial person to start talking publicly. And so give people all the tools and then let them create their own stores and what have you. And so we take a piece of that and run their whole back end. And then we have ads. And then our, obviously our data, financial companies love our data. So we have high margin, simple business right now. It's not huge, but it's a very, it could be a very good business. So, uh, so the people we hate buy our data. And they, you know, they, they're not doing anything sinister with it because they're idiots, but they like to have it. It's just <laughs> their tax. We're taxing them for them being criminals, I guess. <laughs> That's how I get up every morning. That's how I get up every morning. <laughs> yeah. Do any uh, institutional guys uh, participate on stock twits, or is it all individual? Uh, good question. I, th I think it's seventy percent individuals, yeah. and about thirty percent institutions. And the right thirty percent now, they're all listening. Uh, we're the fastest place to just get the pulse on the crazies, and because people trust our brand. So as soon as so the curation helps the institutions, they can make fun of us behind the doors. But they know that the people managing the zoo are like trusted people, and we, we just want to make something great for ourselves. So I think the institutions love us. They just don't use their real name. There's rules in the, in the financial industry, and a lot of them just bang us and rather just pay for the data and put it behind their wall, their wall and just watch it. So, yeah, I mean, if they're registered, they limit someone. There's so many dumb rules, unfortunately, and it's not going to get better. So one of my mistakes is thinking that what Naval at AngelList, I don't know if anybody uses AngelList, I mean, he's a true entrepreneur, one of my favorite entrepreneurs and, and friend. And you know, what he's done around that beg for forgiveness, not ask for permission, is not only did he create a platform where people could actually invest $1,000 in a startup, God bless people, but because uh, it's still better than investing in a penny stock where you don't know the market cap and all that other bullshit and the legal nightmares and the SEC stuff. I mean, I'd rather invest a thousand bucks alongside Mark Andreessen at a stupid price than invest in a bulletin board stock. So good for Naval on that. And I've definitely been a contributor in helping build that uh, community. But more importantly, he went to Washington and fucking 
changed laws. And so if, how, if me, if I came back as uh, 10 years younger, I'd be living in Washington just screaming about Reg FD. Because Stuxnet replaces the news wires. But I mean, I picked the wrong people to fight against. So I got to be more creative because they're never going to give up this battle. Uh, Bloomberg and Reuters. They're, you know, while Google and Facebook and LinkedIn and everybody's fighting, Bloomberg is laughing. Laughing at what's going on in Silicon Valley as he prints money in his private corporation because <laughs> the data is better outside than it is inside. And he's charging $2,000 for his social network and it's basically just a chat product for hedge funds. So uh, chew on that. And so that's why I keep investing in finance because that wall is coming down. It may not be during my lifetime, um, but I want to be part of that because it's just bullshit. People need to be taught that they're going to get screwed, come in with my philosophy. is like fucking check the paperwork, look your partners in the eyes. There's no excuse not to do it anymore. You know, read the paperwork and then you're going to get fucked. Uh, and I think if people came in with that, it's like health insurance. It's like there's a common, we, we're dealing with 1929 security laws. Hello? I mean, I'm an idiot. So beyond that, and start, I just want to be part of this revolution. And Naval is a big part of it. And, uh, and I'm an investor, and I'm an investor in eToro. So I also invest in a lot of things that StockTwits can't do. eToro, which is like StockTwits for the rest of the world, and it's, you can actually trade on it. Oh, God, it's craziness. And it's like Zynga for men. And uh, it, seriously, that's a tagline that I came up with. And they still use it. Um, and it's, a, you know, do 50 million in sales this year. Uh, and so I invest a lot around my space. And a lot of failures, too. Uh, but I don't want to name names. But, you know, I mean, it's littered with failures along the way. Because Bloomberg and Reuters are not going to go quietly. And they're pretty nasty. And uh, you don't want the SEC calling you. Whether you're innocent, you know. Hats off to Naval for dealing with all that stuff. Building a little bit on that, um, what's your perception on the level of diversity, both in terms of companies and innovation, in finance versus, say, social? The rules are holding it back, and you know the financial world is still Wall Street and Park Avenue and London, and you know rules and clubbed and Bloomberg's two thousand dollars a month. You can't negotiate. That's a pretty damn good wall. Um, so that's not going to come down. You know Google and Twitter are going to have to get together and bring that wall down, and that's not where Silicon Valley's heads at. So that's my opportunity or my nightmare, but. Um, Social's overdone and financial's underdone. So there's like a paired trade there somehow. Um, and that's kind of where I fit in, I think. But it's not easy. But you can't fight the, it's hard to fight the government. So I think that makes venture capitalists not want to invest in finance. Um, and when they have invested in finance, you know, Kaching has become wealth front. There's nothing interesting, right? And there's personal capital. And it's like all. Schwab's done all this stuff. Like, why do you want to compete with Schwab when in the end you're going to have to hire people to cut? People want to yell at somebody when the market's down. They don't want to look at their computer and see red and green. They want to call some guy and go, you motherfucker. The market was down and then just hang up. It's like AT&T. It's like I used to call AT&T just to yell. I still call AT&T just yeah, to yell. And the and smart, I don't use them anymore. The smart people hang up on you before you. Yeah. And that, that's smart, you know, those, if I worked at 18, I would just hang up on everybody because <laughs> what are the odds of getting the same person again? But I think, <laughs> I think, I forget the question. The qu I was talking about something. I was talking about something. It was so important. I was talking about how you, oh, in the financial world, we're so used to, it's such a small market in terms of people that are, love the markets and it's so over technologized or whatever with bells and whistles. And my philosophy is you're just handing people nuclear weapons. The more stuff you're giving them to lose money in their accounts, that age is over. Schwab and E-Trade and Meritrade, they blew their brains out. God bless them. They were the bubbles. Uh, and they build infrastructure, and it's more infrastructure than we need. And all we really need to do is like follow smart people. Lynn's and bought Amazon. Just six of my friends just bought Amazon. I'm in. Let me click a button, and I'm in. And alert me when they're out. 
that's the way I see <laughs> financial. No, and it's a, an alerts-based system and a rewards-based system based on I'll do what my smart friends are doing. And just uh, if they don't, and that's stock tips. If you're only telling me when you did good stuff, I'm going to see it on your stream. So, uh, so where it's all going is like, oh, my pocket rings. Oh my God, six of my smartest friends just bought Amazon. I don't even have to look if Amazon's down or up. I can just put three hundred dollars in or three thousand dollars in, and then I'll get an alert when they're selling, and then I'll make that decision myself. I still believe people have got to make those decisions themselves. You made the money, you should manage your money. And everything else is just a lot of noise right now and people hating on things and you gotta learn this stuff. It's a language. Does that help? Yeah. Our signal to noise on stock twitch? I, I think it's depending on your, what you think signal. Everybody's got their own signal to noise ratio. Most people come to StockTwits and leave because they go, the signal to noise is too high. For 99% of the population, no matter how much you curate, the signal to noise is too much. Um, if you go to Yahoo Finance, their front page is just the dumbest headlines, right? You might as well go to BuzzFeed, so, which everybody does. So, uh, or Tech Meme or wherever I go, because that's where I get my news. So signal noise is always high. So you have to tune, and just, there's no answer because you have to tune it, you have to invest time. Um, I think we're lower than every other site, but it doesn't mean if you're just coming there expecting for money to show up in your lap, no. I think you have to mine it. And we just give you the tools to do that. And we're there every day. I, if you sign up and put your picture up there and follow me, you're gonna get a welcome note from me sometime during the day saying, hey, can we help? That's our difference. Twitter had us do it for them Right, genius, uh, by them, and you know, not many companies have that leverage to allow the users to teach each other how to use the product. Now Twitter has 300 people teaching people. Now they know how hard it is, because they have to hire people to actually do what we could have done as an open system. So again, the trade-offs that we all make. We have time for one. Uh, sorry, uh, so what's the strategy to sort of uh, minimize spam going forward? Going forward, we've built our own tools. So it's a good question. 90% uh, of the spam just based on two rules. You know, no penny stocks and you know, just swearing and behavior based and people get bored of being bad. Um, and then we have the community flag stuff and then we have rules about links and there's just, we, nobody's gonna figure it. We've spent four years doing it so we have a pretty good system. Again, most people are wrong. It's just as long as they behave and they're, you know, and they're not spamming. And by spam, I mean just talking about the same thing all day. We tell them, we get online and say, guys, there's other people here. So it's about sharing ideas. It's again, if you teach, if you, and then the community starts behaving a certain way and new people come in and move the, move the markets in different ways and different strategies and styles take over, but it's more, it's very subtle. We have one more question. I think we have one, time for one more. If anyone has one, Brian. Go back to the, so Joe Gavia from Airbnb was uh, here. Uh, he spoke about investing in things that don't scale. So I'm curious, as an investor and an entrepreneur, how do you look at that? Because we've talked about finding things that, that make you excited, but they may not scale. So yeah. from an investment strategy, how does that? Yeah, great. It's a it's the question. That's what, you know, some people like orange, some people like red. So I've invested in anything that I've invested in that scaled, I was lucky because I'm not good enough. You know, I passed on Twitter, Zynga, and, and, and what was the other one? Foursquare. So I passed on those three. So I don't even know scale. Fred knows scale. Certain VCs know what scale looks like and can predict it. Uh, they have the coefficients worked out and the, and the teams and they happen in clusters and what well, you know, I don't have the time. So I invest in people and ideas and scale, scale's all relative to the price that you got in at, right? So I try and map out, here's how I think the next 10 years will play out and I'm, this is such a big trend and there'll be this many acquisitions, this CEO's smart enough and the valuation's at such a point that I think we can get out and this would be a win for us, that's my scale. So it's, my scale is like what's the picture look like and where do we fit in on Picture so when an entrepreneur sends me a deck, I'm like, I only really need to see one slide. Where are you and where's everybody else that's trying to be you fit in on this log scale? And like, what is the market cap and what's your domain experience? And like, I can go through a deck pretty quickly and just see. Um, and so it's, it's, 
you know, some people just are only horny for scale. And, uh, <laughs> and I am more about winning. I don't care about home runs or trips. It's just the idea of winning. And so my scale comes from what I call social leverage, which is the name of our fund, which is this philosophy of like, you just keep doing consistent stuff. Good people, right price, good timing, big trends, and you build this massive scale around your network, which is what I call social leverage, which replaces the era of financial leverage, which we went through, which is like one guy in one room with all the money leveraging it, and it's a great tactic, but it's not really a good strategy. And because it blows up, because there's only one way to get out. So I mean, I have a just, just that's my philosophy. Hopefully that covers it. Awesome, very good. Well, thank you very much, Howard, for stopping by, coming all the way from San Diego for our first soapbox in our new building. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.